It's a new month, a new year, and on Community, it's all about opportunity. Opportunities to celebrate people helping people and also recognize some people doing amazing work in our community. everyone, I'm Claudine Ewing. And I'm Pete Gallivan. We have a full show for you this month. And we're going to start out with an organization that is pooling together a variety of resources to give a new future to the east side. When you look at these streets, what do you see? I see opportunity. Chichi Owenwani was born and raised in Nigeria, but considers Buffalo home and the east side an opportunity for the Queen City's next success story, through a program called the East Side Avenues Initiative. The East Side Avenues Initiative is a public-private philanthropic partnership that is essentially supposed to spur economic activity within the East Side of Buffalo. It all started with a $65 million state investment from the Buffalo Billion, bolstered by another $8 million from local banks and foundations. First bank to jump on was Chi Chi's present employer, KeyBank. But he has seen the project from both sides. Before moving to KeyBank, he was the program coordinator for the initiative. There's a whole lot already going on on the east side. So we're not like building anything. We're not. We're essentially just taking, you know, the things that's already there and just trying to figure out how to improve those things, right? So by working with the community, trying to figure out how can we build upon what's already on the east side avenue. So that's the essence of what we've been trying to do. The program focuses on revitalization along the four commercial corridors on the east side, Bailey, Fillmore, Jefferson, and Michigan. Its key is a series of five programs that promote personal investment from the stakeholders within the community. When those individuals themselves live up to their potential, full potential, then the community benefits. Those programs are a transformation of the east side commercial districts, real estate development training for building owners, commercial stabilization for historic buildings, promoting tourism along the Michigan Street Heritage District, and the reactivation of the Central Terminal. The program is as much about promoting pride within the neighborhoods as it is bringing in outside investment. Part of the East Side Avenue's initiative is to also help change the narrative. Because oftentimes people hear, you know, one narrative that tends to get stuck, you know, for years and decades, but by lifting up individuals within the community themselves, people are able to see a different narrative. Narrative. In January, we must pause and reflect on MLK. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke, preached, and wanted better, whether it was jobs or human relations. What cannot be ignored is race. Siena College did a poll on the heels of the MLK holiday. Here are some of the questions to New Yorkers, followed by comments from pollster Stephen Greenberg. Question, do you think minority New Yorkers have the same opportunities to be successful as white New Yorkers? 52% said yes, 41% said no. There's a disparity by political party, gender, and race. 58% of white New Yorkers and 55% of Latino New Yorkers believe that minorities have the same opportunities as whites to succeed. However, 71% of black voters say no. Question, how would you describe the state of race relations in New York State? 8% said excellent, 28% good, 41% fair, 19% poor. The blacks and whites feel very much the same in terms of the state of race relations in New York. 806 registered voters were polled. Question, do you think minorities, including blacks, Latinos, and Asians who live in the state, experience racial or ethnic discrimination? 72% said yes, 19% said no, 2% said sometimes or occasionally. Governor Kathy Hochul spoke at an MLK event in Brooklyn. I checked out a book about his life when I was a child at the local library. Now, just so you know, I came from a big, rambunctious family. My only escape was to go to the local library, all these loud siblings. So I went there, and I pulled out the book on the shelves, and he was still alive at the time. I did a re book report on what he was all about and his story and how powerful it was. I signed a bill introduced by Senator Kevin Parker and Assemblymember Taylor Darling that declared that racism is a public health crisis today. 
Let's call it what it is. It is a public health crisis. What would Dr. King say today? More importantly, what are we doing in 2022? Even Kathy Hochul said today, you know, this is like a crisis. Um, so what should be done with these numbers? It certainly informs our leaders of how their constituents feel. Uh, and certainly I think there would be, if not unanimity, pretty darn close to unanimity among upstaters and downstaters, Democrats and Republicans and blacks and whites, that we'd all like to see the state of race relations in New York improve. 2021 was quite the year in politics, especially in the race for mayor. Two people, a man, a woman, the veteran incumbent won, but the unsuccessful candidate, India Walton, landed a new job. Has India Walton gone away? No, India Walton can't go away, and I'm always going to be a strong advocate and a fighter for what's just and what's right. Walton has a new job that she says is a good fit. She's senior advisor for special projects for the New York Working Families Party. I'll continue to work um, locally, but I am going to work hand in hand with the progressive slate, um, the city council slate in Rochester. Um, and I'll also be doing quite a bit of work at the at the state level um, advocating for budget priorities and legislation to be passed that benefits working class people. Also um, recruiting, training and supporting grassroots candidates um, who want to carry the progressive values of the Working Families Party. Her campaign was thrust into the state and national spotlight. Really shined a bright light on Buffalo as a hotbed of labor and progressive activism. That is momentum that we can't allow to just dwindle off. And then there's this card she received in the mail. It was from um, President Barack Obama. I'm proud of what we accomplished as a campaign. Um, I'm proud of the way I've grown as an individual. Um, and that sort of uh, put the final stamp of approval that I was doing the right thing. I, Byron W. Brown. The winner, Byron. Mayor Byron Brown, was sworn in at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site Brown. with only his family and a judge present. He is now in his fifth term and promising more development for all neighborhoods, affordable housing, inclusion, and diversity. And I think in this election that we just came through, uh, the majority of people in this community, in this city, were saying that they wanted someone who was in the middle. They did not want a socialist. They did not want a far left entity. But at the same time, we have seen the destruction uh, from the far right. Uh, so I'm going to continue to focus on the middle and bringing people together. Friends of Night People helps those dealing with homelessness and poverty. Coming up, see how they are getting help. We're serving anywhere right now from 100 to 150 meals each night. Welcome back to Community. Well, we are celebrating people helping people. We work for a company that is giving back to Western New York, and so many other companies across Western New York are doing their share to help everyone. Giving back, the recipient, Friends of Night People. A $5,000 check will go a long way. This is an organization founded over 50 years ago as a safe place, and now they help those dealing with homelessness and poverty. So the gift from last year is really going to help us get more food, more meals out to individuals, uh, whether it's through our dining room or through our food pantry. Um, you know, at about $2 per meal, $5,000 goes a long way in, you know, helping people get fresh fruit uh, and produce for their home or dairy products through our pantry, uh, or just helping provide meals and, you know, put some nice protein items and have real nice meals for people to eat here uh, at our kitchen here or in our partnerships uh, with other agencies across the city. I think the, the, the community that they support is one that is certainly, I would say, underserved and overlooked. And that is what our, our mission is, to try and find those organizations that support this community. And we, we've done, and certainly with the help of our partners at Channel 2, we've together sort of identified this as one of those organizations that have done an amazing job with very little resources, but they're very efficient and they provide a, a wonderful service to the folks that they service. Many areas of the city we reach out with our community meals, our food pantries, helping individuals, 
uh, to get by, whether it's with a blanket or boots. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's, it's snowy or hot and sunny. Uh, we're here 365 days a year. We're serving anywhere right now from 100 to 150 meals each night uh, and those go to individuals who you know are usually on the street a little bit transient maybe they're staying at shelter staying at friend's house uh, and those meals that we give them give them the warmth and the nourishment the compassion uh, that helps them get through each day we provide clothing on a nightly basis uh, or as needed where people can get jackets blankets linens uh, those are always items that are much needed uh, in the winter time it's boots in the summer it's sneakers and then we also have personal care items, whether it's soap, shampoo, laundry detergent, hygiene products. Uh, our medical clinic, uh, you know, helps see people with acute issues. Friends of Night People are always looking for donations and volunteers. Also receiving a Tegna grant was Native American Community Services on Buffalo's West Side. NAX, as it's called, was founded in 1975 to provide quality health and social services to the off-reservation native populations in Erie and Niagara counties. And in keeping with their tradition of caring, they have since grown into a full-scale human services agency committed to helping the entire community, regardless of race or background. As opposed to others identifying what they think is wrong with us and giving us what they think are solutions, we're generating from within our own communities and our own families to find that better path forward. Executive Director Michael Martin says the $3,000 grant will be used to help Native people continue to heal from the centuries of abuse inflicted by programs such as the Indian residential schools, in which children were removed from their home and educated in the ways of the European, a form of ethnic cleansing. The founder of one such school said the program was meant to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man. Next, we'll be restarting their Gathering of Good Minds initiative, which has been one of their most successful efforts toward addressing the intergenerational issues of trauma that Native people continue to endure. The understanding now that our traditional teachings were always intended to keep us healthy and well, and, you know, another big word is decolonization, you know, trying to go back to before the negative impact of colonization, which is, you know, the boarding schools and the residential schools are one part of that legacy, that really goes back to even the, the, you know, the 1400s and the doctrines of discovery. The program is designed to use traditional teachings as a means of building a new future. The U.S. Mint is honoring American women with a new series of quarters. The first woman to receive the honor is Maya Angelou. Angelou is depicted on the coin with her arms uplifted. Behind her are a bird and the rising sun, inspired by her poetry. The writer, performer, and activist is best known for her autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and for reading her poem on the pulse of morning at the inauguration of President Bill Clinton. Come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny. She received a Presidential Medal of Freedom from former President Barack Obama. In that moment, you are steadied and you are fine. Angelo died in 2014 at the age of 86. The new series of coins will be produced through 2025. For years, a section of Fillmore Avenue in Buffalo was all about Lee. Lee's Barbecue, Lee's Lounge, and Lee's Car Wash. Owner Lee Smith provided opportunity to people, many of whom lived in the neighborhood. He was an east side entrepreneur. In 2002, while doing a story on soul food, I stopped by Lee's Barbecue. Lee was always gracious and welcoming, but he was all about cooking those ribs in a certain kind of way, and he was not going to bend. It got to be done like none with charcoal, you know. The gas grill, they don't taste right. At Lee's Barbecue in Buffalo, ribs cut and cooked just right has kept business steady for 30 years. Ribs cooked slowly on charcoal and a secret sauce has people licking their fingers. 80% of the ribs is a good sauce. Lee Smith died in December. He died at home. He was 88 years old. Coming up, women from the past and present and a designer making moves, and he's from the Queen City. I grew up in Buffalo and everything, but I never really had to struggle. And moving to New York, it was a, a huge transition.
Local artist Julia Bottoms has been selected to design a statue honoring the late Shirley Chisholm. Chisholm was the first black woman to serve in the United States Congress and the first to run for president. So this is going to be a project honoring the life and legacy of Shirley Chisholm. Uh, what we're doing is we're creating a sculpture that's going to go outside of her final resting place in Forest Lawn. Uh, the sculpture is going to be bronze over top of a granite base is to create something that's very like natural and representative of who she was as a person rather than, you know, when we think of statues, we think of just kind of a stiff traditional portrait. Uh, but we wanted to go kind of beyond that and create something that's a little bit more lively and representing her as a person. I wanted to have it sort of represent the really cool, funky outfits that she was known for wearing, a lot of bold patterns. The other big thing is the stance that she actually has. So I have her in front of a podium um, giving a speech, but I have her holding up the peace sign, which she was known to do during her speeches, and just poised but relaxed at the same time. I wanted to show that she has confidence, but she also had that ability to relate to people and really reach them when she speaks. Bottoms is the current artist in residence at the Albright Knox Northland site. You can see some of her work on the Freedom Wall. She's excited about the Chisholm project. We had to write a proposal for it and part of the proposal component was talking about what she meant to us personally and I'm like this is easy for me um, because what Shirley did was she knocked down barriers for black women to go into fields, whether it's for her politics, where traditionally it's dominated by white men. And I feel that in the sense of like working in fine arts, we look at a long history of fine arts where it's mostly we think of older white men. Um, so to be a black woman creating and getting a project of this magnitude is significant to me, not only because it's a project I'm excited to work on, but I see the parallels between the work that she was trying to accomplish and me standing here in 2022 you know, being able to produce work like this, that, that would have been unheard of in a past time. One of her more famous quotes, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. We're doing um, that kind of incorporated into the statue. So it's sort of subtle, but on the side of it, you're gonna see there's that little folding chair there. Um, and again, I think that's important to me as well, because I think about how she's opened those doors. And not only did she bring a seat for herself, but she left it there for women like me and women that have come after me to be able to continue on and keep doing work like that. The statue will be installed near the Birchwood Mausoleum this fall. Justice Shirley Troutman is now the second black woman appointed to New York's highest court, the New York Court of Appeals. The nominee is confirmed. Congratulations. Troutman was an appellate judge and former prosecutor for Erie County. Before the vote, she listened as Senator spoke. Representation matters. It, it, it matters to see people like you in these positions, in decision-making positions. Judge Troutman is a proud graduate of Bennett High School. Uh, she's a tiger through and through. Uh, she went to UB Law School, sorry, UB undergraduate, Albany Law School. After the Senate confirmed Governor Hochul's nominee, she issued a statement calling Justice Troutman an extraordinary addition to the New York State Court of Appeals and lauding her extraordinary qualifications, her superlative legal mind, her fair-minded judicial philosophy, and her commitment to equity and justice for all New Yorkers. Some criminal justice advocates called her a well-regarded jurist but expressed disappointment that the Court of Appeals is full of a majority of former prosecutors but senators confirmed her for what she will bring. She understands the role of protecting the public. Troutman will take the seat created by the retirement of Justice Eugene Fahey, also a Buffalo. My mother to this day, when you walk into the house in the hall, the first picture you see is Martin Luther King. There is no accident. Um, I, I am a product of all of the accomplishments that have occurred, and I don't take it lightly. And um, it, it, I was reminded um, the adage of to whom much is given, much is required, and the necessity that I continue to do the things that I've been doing in the past, and I certainly intend to do so to the extent that is certainly humanly possible. I understand that it is also not just um, girls of color, there are women who, um, they have been wonderful of all races that I have mentored and interacted with. So I understand the importance of 
uh, administering the law, but I understand also what I represent when I'm doing it. Meet Tim B, celebrity fashion stylist, and you guessed it, he's from the 716. Basically our wardrobe, celebrities, uh, models, advertising campaigns, music videos, commercials, anything you need an outfit for, I'm the person that you call. <laughs> I always had a thing for fashion. It was like always my thing, but it was more so geared towards men's fashion. Like I knew nothing about women's fashion. But women's fashion is what he does. Let's go back. This is a young man who had an early dream. I found a paper from the sixth grade where it said, I want to be an entrepreneur like my father. 2009, he got his start while attending Buffalo State College. A friend suggested he consider fashion as a major. He got an internship, and a couple of years later, he took off to the Big Apple. Best decision I ever made. Um, and from there, like three months later, I landed my first client, um, which was Little Kim. And um, I went on to host uh, the style segment on 106 Park. She looks beautiful. Like. The only thing I would lose is the, the purse. My first break was um, Angelique Preston from America's Next Top Model, and she's from Buffalo. And I work with Lala Anthony, um, Ashanti, uh, The City Girls, Jay Wild, Angela Simmons. Walk me through what you do to make the style work for a star or a woman. Try to get into their mind like I observe them with everything they do, like, every single thing because you kind of got to become the person to know what's going to work, what's going to fit, and even to try new things. So um, after all of that, we do a fitting um, and we see what works and what doesn't work. Take it to go get tailored to the body <laughs> and then the actual, then the actual event. And um, it's a long drawn out process. And he says he's seen careers change just based on how a person is dressed. I feel like you exude a, a certain confidence um, when when you're dressed well. Who's been your favorite to style? The 2019 BT Awards with uh, Little Kim where she performed with Mary J. Blige. We did a custom um, jacket um, that she and I both designed together. We got a great response from that. A versus against Ashanti and Keisha Coles. Um, it was an Alexander McQueen blazer, um, and she wore shoes by Jennifer Lee. Tim B is an award-winning fashion stylist, a 30 under 30 change maker. Named Stylist of the Year in 2021 by Sheen Magazine, he's been seen on Lala's Full Court Life and BET's 106 in Park. It's a time, yeah, that's a time for it. It's an awesome dress. Yeah, she looks amazing. In the future, he'd like to style Bruno Mars. He's now 32 a mover and shaker, but he'll tell you it wasn't always easy. Moving to New York, it was a, a huge transition. I had to struggle and it was times where I was homeless. I slept in my car for like two weeks and it was like, I, I moved to New York with like $78. Like I really put in years and years of work. I'm not trying to count your coins, but you're okay now, right? Oh, I'm great now. <laughs> I just was not giving up. So when everything started changing and I started like living off of my career, I was like, wow, I really, I really made something of myself. Like I, I, I tripled and quadrupled that $78. Thanks so much for joining us for another month here on Community. We'll be back next month to celebrate Black History Month and really everything that's great about Western New York. And there's a lot going on in Western New York that we want to celebrate. We'll see you next month.